I was a kid growing up in Louisiana in a rural area, <clears throat> we had a driveway. It was kind of a, a half-circle driveway, you know what I'm talking about? And it wasn't paved, but it had a lot of rocks in it. And um, one of the things that I like to do, and I guess my brother also, was to go outside and pick up those rocks and throw them. See, guys, back in that day, that was our video games, throwing rocks at trees and trash cans. And my favorite target was this uh, big light pole that was there right by the road and right by our circle driveway. And I would take those rocks and I would love to throw them and hear them clunk off of that thing. Now, on a few occasions, my aim was good enough they had that, you know, that wire that comes all the way down, real tight, tight wire. I'd hit that thing sometimes, and it would sound like a laser gun from Star Wars going off. Pew! And I thought that was really cool. My mom and dad, especially my dad, said not to throw rocks. Um, one reason is you never know what you're going to accidentally hit. Cars might be coming up and down this road, and it was very rural, so that wasn't usual, but it could happen. You might hit a car going by. You might accidentally hit a bird and kill it. And that's, That was the Andy Griffith episode, if you ever watched that one, a good one where Opie hits the bird and has to raise the baby birds. It's a good episode. Or, you know what? Those rocks are in the driveway for a reason because when it rains, there is no pavement here, and this will just turn into a muddy mess and you go, we don't want that. So don't throw rocks. And yet, here I was, throwing rocks. The last time I threw rocks at that pole was the day I threw a rock, and that sucker went flying, and i got to tell you, it was a good chunk, and it hit that light fixture, the street lamp, and broke it. Uh-oh is right. That immediate moment wasn't like, well, that was a good shot. It was, <sighs> yeah, I got in trouble. Had to pay for it by mowing grass and mowing grass and mowing grass to pay for it. Absolutely. So here I am as a father with three boys. We go to different playgrounds, and many of the playgrounds these days, the, the, the stuff on the playground are little rocks, smaller than these. You were handed a rock you should have been when you came in. If you didn't, there's some on that back uh, offering table back there. Uh, you can grab one. You'll, you might need it later. Not to throw it, but to hold on to for a minute. <laughs> But I take my boys, and the rocks are smaller. They're, they're kind of like these kind of gravelly rocks. And they're there for traction and everything and to keep the, the, the stuff from washing away. And we tell them, don't throw rocks. And what do you think the first thing that Jericho and Niall do, our little ones, when they go into the playground? They throw rocks. They like to pick up the rocks, climb up the, the slide, and drop them down and slide, slide with the rocks. It's one of Niall's favorite games. And that's okay. But eventually it turns into picking them up and throwing them. And they hit somebody. So... They're told not to do it, and yet they do it. Have you ever done something that you, were, you knew you were not supposed to do? I mean, we all have, haven't we? we? We've all found ourselves doing something we know we're not supposed to do. Well, in the Bible, Jesus has some things that he says that you're not to do. He says there are some things not to do. And so for the, today and the next few weeks, we're going to look at this, the, this, the reality that sometimes we get tied up in the knots. We, if we find ourselves... Um, in this, these places, doing the things Jesus says not to do. And this may not always be what we're thinking of right away when we think of that. So we're really going to look at some places in the Bible where Jesus says not to do something. Today we're going to look at a story. It's a, it's a pretty popular story, and I was kind of surprised to look at my... my I keep a, a, a record of every scripture I preach from, and there's some I preach from over and over, and I know that, and, and you know, forgive me, but I've never preached this before. And I was like, how have I never preached this, this story from John 8? Who's got your Bibles? Great. Turn to John chapter 8 if you do have your Bibles. And if you don't, you can grab one from the book rack, those little Bibles in the book rack. And where we'll be reading in John 8 is actually on page 816. You can turn there if you do use the, the book rack Bible. Um, John 8, is, uh, we'll be looking at the words of Jesus today and also the next few weeks as we look at the, the idea that we get tied up in these knots. What does Jesus say to us? So in this passage, what has been happening is Jesus has been teaching a pretty radical message, love. <laughs> the love of God. And he'd been in, in Jerusalem for the Passover, and he had been talking in a way that was different. They hadn't heard a rabbi teach this way before. A rabbi was a teacher of, of, the, of the religion, and they hadn't heard one teach this way. And his, his expression of love came across very radical, and so much so that there were people who were saying, in this, the chapter before this, surely he's the Messiah. 
the, the, the Savior sent from God. Surely, he, and others were arguing, there's no way. I mean, he's from Galilee, right? And the Messiah's not going to be from Galilee. So they had these arguments going on. Meanwhile, the religious leaders of that day, of Jesus' religion, were the Pharisees and the priests. And they heard about this, and they were pretty upset because Jesus was, really, Jesus was kind of stealing some of their thunder. That was really the, the, where they started getting upset. And so they sent their, their guards out. They had a temple guard, by the way. Sometimes we kind of wish we had one of those here. It's like the temple guard to go get the guys. And they, they went out to go get Jesus. But all these people were having this big debate. He's the Messiah. He's got so much support. And then there's some others who are disagreeing with it. So they didn't do anything. So they come back to the, pre, the priests and the Pharisees. And, and they're like, why didn't you do anything about this Jesus? And they're like, I'm telling you what. They're saying he's the Messiah. And it's going to cause a riot. So these religious leaders wanted to trap Jesus. So this is where this story kind of picks up for us. They wanted to find a way to get rid of Jesus without causing a riot. So John chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. He was speaking, as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then they stooped, he stooped down again and rode in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't any one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have light that leads to life. We'll stop there and let's pray. Lord, we love you. And we thank you that you are, as we sang earlier, friend of sinners. As we see in this passage that you're the one writing in the sand as the stones fall from the hands of the accusers. And Lord, we, as we pray, and this morning we all kind of received a stone, and we may have it in our hand right now. Lord, today, help us to reflect of what our heart is like. Is it like your heart? Where are we when you say, sin not, but follow me? Go, go your way and sin no more. Where, where are we with that? Because, Jesus, your, your way is the way to light and life. And, uh, Lord, we, we need light in our lives and we certainly want the life that you've created us to live, a life that's an abundant life, full life, a life that's the way it's meant to be, the way you created it to be in the beginning. And so, Lord, we want that, and you've made it available to us if we will follow you. And so help us to understand that today from this passage. Or maybe we'll see ourselves in this, this story, maybe as an onlooker, or maybe as one of the guys with the rocks, or maybe even the woman who was brought before Jesus. But, Lord, more than that, help us, help us to see you in our story that you're the one who is saying, neither do I. Go and sin no more. And we thank you that that's who you are. And Holy Spirit of God, we acknowledge you are our teacher. And so we surrender our hearts, our minds, and our ears to you, that you would teach us and then equip us and move us when we leave this place in just a few minutes, that, Lord, we would go into our community and be the hands and feet of Jesus to the unchurched families that need your grace your amazing grace. And it's in your name, your name, Jesus, our awesome God that we pray. And everybody said, Amen. If, uh, if you want to take some notes or track with the outline this morning, I would definitely kind of suggest you do that. So I'll give you the, the big idea and, and go, go into this a little deeper. Following Jesus leads out of darkness and into light and a full Life. I would even say into the, the fullness of life, a fulfilling life. Following Jesus leads out of darkness and into light and a fulfilling fullness of life. So the, we're talking about sin not today. And, and I've kind of come under the, the gun sometimes of like, you don't preach on sin enough. So like there's some pet sins people want you to preach about as a preacher. When you don't do that enough, they, you kind of hear about it or say, tell it to somebody else who tells it to somebody else who tells you. Hey, that person who left 
six months ago, said you don't ever preach on sin. Well, today's the sin sermon, so get ready. <laughs> it says sin night. So what is sin? Help me out, because this is one of those things in our world today, if we're just being honest, um, it's very difficult to, to use that word because some people, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't call anybody a sinner. You shouldn't judge. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks, about judging. You know, he says judge not. But today's about sin not. So what is sin? Doing something you know is wrong. That's a good definition. What, what else we got? Willful, willful transgression of God's law. Good. What? Separation from God. Anything else? Okay, when you do something you know God doesn't want you to do. Good. Or you don't do something you know he does want you to do. Good. Good definitions today. So when it comes to defining sin, we've got a good grasp of this, I think. So, so it's not so much about that as it is to what does it mean for us, because we can define it pretty good. That's great, and that's a good place for us to start. Sin is this, and this is kind of where we'll start with your, if you're filling in the blanks. It's the, we use that word transgression. Sin is a transgression of the heart of God. Transgression means to know you're not supposed to go that way, but you go on it anyway. You know, keep off the grass and you step on it, you transgressed on that. So that's, that's kind of where that word comes from. So take a moment and feel your stone, the, the stone, the rock that you were given. I'm going to use this one now. I'm going to upgrade. Feel your stone. It's got properties to it. Uh, this, your stone, is, it's got some heaviness to it. It's got a little bit of hardness to it. Your, your stone is uh, probably, because most of the stones that we use today were kind of the polished ones that we're, we, we got, so it's probably not coarse, but this one is definitely coarse. And this is what a heart that transgresses the heart of God is like. Our heart becomes hard. It's heavy and it's coarse, just like the stones that we're holding here. You may even feel like you want to throw it. You have that stone in your hand and you're like, oh, it's just, as soon as I get it in my hand, I kind of have that automatic reflex, just like that country boy throwing to throw it at that pole. Just a reflex, we want to throw it. But that's what sin is. God's heart is to bring love and peace and hope and, yes, joy to those hearts that are void of his love, his peace, his hope, and his joy. That's God's heart. That's what, that's what he desires to do. God's heart is softened with grace and turned towards people, turns, turned towards sinners, those who are just like this woman we read about today. And sin is the opposite of God's heart. Sin is the transgression of the heart of God. So they say, teacher, to Jesus, this woman was caught in the sin of adultery. And right off the bat, you know what? They didn't say anything wrong. I mean, they didn't say anything that wasn't true, apparently. I mean, we're just going to assume it, it really did happen. That they really didn't say anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with calling sin exactly what it is. That's what they did at first. That wasn't their heart, though. There's nothing wrong with calling sin exactly what it is. But something we hear a lot is, you'll probably be able to finish this, well, hate the sin, but... Love the sinner. Absolutely. We hear, that, we hear that quite a bit. It's kind of become part of our, our modern church language. Well, yeah, you've got to love the sinner, but you've got to hate the sin. Absolutely. And, and this is where we fail at acknowledging a problem with this. Well, that's true. We do need to, we do have to, we've got to love people. And we do need to have a, a, an awareness of what sin is. But what happens if we're looking at the reality of our lives and the lives of, of people all around us that sin is not simply behavior. Remember, it's a transgression of the heart of God. It's a heart issue. It's a soul issue. It's, a, it becomes, it's an identity issue. And it's a part of who we are whenever we have a sin. It's more than just behavior. It comes from the heart, and so it becomes a part of our identity. And it's very difficult to separate loving a person and hating a part of their identity. So we have, we have difficulty with this. It's a challenge to do this. So what did the law say? This is where the default comes in. Okay, well, what does the law say? And these Pharisees, these, these, these guys that brought this woman to Jesus, they know the law very well. They are the teachers of the law. They study the law. They add extra things to the law to show you how to keep the law. So they know the law. They knew that Leviticus 20.10 says, If a man commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the man and the woman who have committed adultery must be put to death. They're actually kind of quoting that. They kind of took some liberties with it, actually, if we read it and we, we see that there's only one person they brought there. You know. But they're actually kind of saying, this is what the law of Moses says. She must be stoned. What say you, Jesus? She was guilty. 
Nobody denied she was guilty. She didn't even deny she was guilty. Jesus didn't even say, no, she's not a sinner. He didn't say that. You could call her what, in essence, today, you would say, here's a home wrecker, here's, a, here's an adulteress, here's a hussy. Might even use the, the word whore. So here's the, and it would, be, it would be true, but it would not be nice. It would not be, it would not be very nice, would it? but it might be true. And like most sin, adultery is a sin against God and against another person. Now, this is specific to her situation, but if we think about every one of our sins that we may have, it's a heart issue, which makes it a sin against God and a sin against another person, other people. And like most sin, Jesus didn't regard adultery as a sin you commit as much as the, what exists in your heart. Because in his famous sermon, we call the Sermon on the Mount, he said this, You've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He says, it's a heart issue. The sin isn't just the act. It's the heart issue that leads you to the act. And there's this very popular kind of idea today for a lot of guys, and, and some girls too, a lot of guys, to justify looking at pornography because nobody else gets hurt. And what they fail to realize, Jesus says right here, anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. So when we encounter sin, when we encounter these things, like these Pharisees did, these, these teachers of the law, it's a, uh, a wrong has been done to someone or to ourselves. And when we encounter that, we have this natural desire for justice. Justice must be served. And where that has gone to in our culture is, what we really want is revenge, which is not the same as justice. In the case of our story today, there was clearly no interest in justice because their goal was to discredit Jesus. The stone throwing had actually already started verbally in order to, to this woman who was just kind of in the way. and they, they had, She was their, go, their scapegoat to get to Jesus. That's what was going on here. And the same thing happens with us sometimes. Stones often get thrown before we even pick up a rock because it has to do with attitude. It has to do with words that we say. Hurtful words and actions fly from a heart that is hard and heavy and coarse and far from the heart of God. Sin destroys the lives that Jesus loves. Sin destroys lives of the people that Jesus loves. For the woman, it was her, 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 her heart that had led her into an affair of some kind. And for these Pharisees, it was their attitude against Jesus, but also this woman. In essence, sin is a corruption of God's creation. That's what it is. Sin is a corruption of God's creation. And to see others as Jesus does is to see them through the heart of God, to see them, to say, God, give me your heart, to see people the way you see them and recognize the corruption but still love the creation. That's where we're at. That's, where, that's what we have to be doing right now in this day, in this culture, in our city, in our community, is recognizing the corruption but loving the creation. And God loves every single person that he's created. And there's not a single person alive that he didn't create. We might come down hard on those despicable Pharisees now. We're like, oh yeah, those guys, they're despicable. They're just trying to get Jesus and they brought this woman out there. And the, in, in, in the cultural context, she would have been stripped down. So I mean, this is a public shaming that's taking place here. And if we're being honest... We're not much different sometimes than the Pharisees. I mean, I, I pray that we are. I pray that we, we, we grow out of that as we follow Christ. But haven't we all at some point or another kind of pushed to get our own way? That's what they were doing. They were, making, they were pushing to get their way of what they wanted. Haven't we all had times when we got upset about things that, that in the view of, reality, of eternity, the reality of eternity, some things just don't matter? When Jesus is the subject... He's, Jesus has reminded me this week through my studies and prayers and just, just through a conference that some of us went to here in town yesterday, a, a church leadership conference, that we know the end. When you read the end of this Bible, it tells us that victory, Jesus is the victor, and we are his bride. And we, we spend eternity with him in a place where there is no more tears and no more uh, weeping and all, the, all our pains and all our, our shame. It's all gone for all eternity. That's victory. That's awesome. And if we look at today in the view of eternity, some things just don't matter. 
We all get tangled up in sin. If you're tracking with the notes, that's your next part. You'll get tangled up in sin, kind of like this rope. We do, you know how it goes. You do, well, you, you accidentally did something. I said I would never do that again, but I kind of, well, I was stressed. Then you lie about it. And then, well, your friends caught you, so they said, well, hey, why don't you go ahead and do it again? So you do it again. So before you know it, you're all tangled up in this knot, in this rope, in this stuff. We all get tangled up in sin. We all have been tangled up in sin at some point. That's the whole awesome idea of salvation and sanctification, is that sanctification, to, I see it now as the process of Jesus and the Holy Spirit untying the knots as we walk with him and untying the twisted stuff that we have made our lives into, that he spends a lifetime untying those knots and untwisting and untangling that stuff. Because haven't we all done things that we desired instead of what God desires? Because that's ultimately bottom line, sin. Doing what I desire instead of what God desires. To Jesus, they say, the law says stoner. What say you, Jesus? What say you, teacher? And Jesus knew their hearts were far from the heart of God. He knew that. He knew their real intent was to trap him. He simply did what? He stooped down and rode in the dust. And I'm always reminded of Genesis chapter 2 that said God reached down into the dust and formed man and woman out of the dust of the ground. I kind of see, I just kind of connect those two, not necessarily that's the way it is, but I, for me I just see that, that, that Jesus is just like, he created, he's the creator, and here's this one he created being put on this trial. And he stoops down and he writes in the dust. And the question always comes up, well, why did Jesus ride in the dust? I think probably a, a lot of us, that's one of the first things that we want to do when we get to heaven, right? Okay, Jesus, John chapter 8, what did you ride in the dust? Who knows? I mean, he, he could have been writing what we call Leviticus 20.10. He could have been writing that, that, that out there and then writing, where is the man? Right? It says if a man commits, remember we read that a minute ago, if a man commits adultery, they should both be brought and stoned to death. Maybe he wrote that. Maybe he was making the list of the sins of all these Pharisees. <laughs> Maybe that's what he was writing down. <laughs> Lying, cheating, <laughs> you know. Maybe he wrote a maybe he, was, maybe he drew a smiley face emoji and wrote hashtag idiots. I don't know. He, whatever he did, whatever he wrote, here's what we know. Jesus knew it was a trap, and he did not get rattled. He knew that they were out to get him, and he did not get upset. He did not bust them out. He didn't start picking up stones and throwing them at these guys. He didn't post a rant on Facebook. And then this is the second, my, my second favorite part of the story. He stands up to these guys and he says, okay, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down to write in the dust again. And one by one, they dropped their stones and slipped away, beginning with the oldest. And I think that's an interesting detail that I kind of want to go, okay, John, when you told this story, why, why did that? Because I have some ideas. I mean, one, one idea could be that, he, that this is a detail that's in there because, well, the, more, these, the older ones knew that, well, they had, they had had more years to sin, and so they knew that they, they had more to be forgiven, and they had more stuff, more baggage, and more junk. So they were like, nope, I can't do it. Um, another idea could be that, well, the, the younger ones probably took their cue from the older ones. I mean, that was really the, old, the older ones of the religious law were the ones who taught the younger ones. So probably could be that, well, they dropped their stones and the younger ones were waiting for the cue. What do we do? You know, if Josiah throws a stone, good, because we can do it. But he didn't. Or maybe, and I like to think maybe this could be it, and this is just my opinion, but it could be with age comes maturity, and with maturity, spiritual maturity, we come to know that we all need a Savior. That I'm still a man in need of a Savior. These Pharisees who would say, you've got to keep this law, this law, this law, and here's the way you do it, and walk this strict trail. I believe that somehow in their maturity, their spiritual maturity, that they realize we are all still in need of a Savior. Spiritual maturity begins with realizing we all need a Savior. In Romans 3.23 says, Everyone has sinned. For all fall short of God's glorious standard. Everyone has been tangled up in the knots. 
We tend to gravitate towards this philosophy that no sin is greater than any other sin. Right? I mean, God sees all sin the same, but yet we act as if some sins are greater sins. We have the, the idea, the philosophy, and the verbiage that says you know, all sin is sin, and God sees all sin the same, and yet we act like there are sins that are greater. Surely I'm not as bad as they are. I mean, surely my sin isn't as bad as theirs. Well, at least I'm not a whatever. I mean, we, we do that sometimes. We measure sins. We compare ourselves to others. And there's the, there's the big problem with a lot of these knots that Jesus is going to tell us we're going to look at over the next few weeks is we compare ourselves to others. And we either see ourselves as lower or higher than we ought to. And we should just look at Jesus. But when we pick up stones and throw them, we're all guilty of transgressing the heart of God. And we may not actually pick up rocks in our society, but we do throw verbal stones quite a bit in our culture. And these stones that we throw look like this. Sometimes they're words of gossip. Words of gossip. And chances are, by this time in your life, you have felt a stone of gossip hit you before. Sometimes it hits you in the back. That's usually where they hit. Sometimes they hit you right square between the eyes. And they hurt. And how do we, when we know the love of Christ and we know the pain of those stones of gossip, how do we then pick them up and throw them? Other stones that we may throw are words of judgment. And it hurts to be judged unfairly, doesn't it? I mean, if you've ever been judged unfairly, it hurts. It's not, it doesn't feel good. That's because it's a stone that hits us. And we still tend to do that sometimes. And Jesus says, judge not. And we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. And there are words of harshness. Harshness. Just because something is true doesn't mean it's necessary to cause injury by the way you say it. Just because something's true doesn't mean it's necessary by the way you say it. Here's this woman caught in adultery. Jesus took the high road, stooped down and drew in the sand. We might be tempted to justify ourselves by thinking, well, you know, we're talking about words here. And yes, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And the words I say surely aren't as bad as the actions of that person. And again, we default to comparing ourselves with somebody else instead of looking in the mirror that we need to. Because sin is sin is sin is sin. And that's what God's Word says about it. Listen to this. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Ouch. That was my toes too. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself. I don't want to fool myself and I don't want you to fool yourselves. Guys, this is so important we get this because it's easy for us to go, well, we're not like those Pharisees at all unless we realize we throw verbal stones. Sometimes we even pitch them on Facebook or wherever. I get asked sometimes. Actually, I get in these conversations sometimes, and and I'll say, "Well, you kind of you choose your words very carefully. I mean, you you seem to be kind of guarded with what you say. The reason is, I don't want to be guilty of throwing stones. I'm not trying to cover up anything for anybody. I want the truth needs to be the truth. But I don't want to be guilty of throwing the stones that Jesus says, I'm not throwing it. Jesus says, I'm not throwing it." So remember, it's that lesson I learned. When you let a stone fly, you don't get to choose where it goes. You might be aiming one place, but you never know where that stone might hit, who it might hurt. So don't throw stones. We all get tangled up in sin. And here's the great news. Here's the, here's the good news that really is the best news. Jesus transforms sinners. That's the good news. That's why I'm so excited to have this message. It's not not the fact that we all get tangled up in sin and we all are guilty of of rock throwing, but it's that Jesus transforms sinners. Take a minute and watch this short video of how awesome it is. Think about it. And Jesus, Jesus doesn't want to just make you better. I mean, that's that's one of the, the fallacies we have is we're looking for something in our culture to help us be better, to help us be better, have a better life. 
Jesus doesn't want to help you be better. He wants to make you new. He wants to make us new. And he, he wants to so much that he, he'll take our place if we'll say yes. People say, yes, Jesus, I, I want that newness of life. I want you to transform me. And, and he wants to take your sin and my sin and get rid of it. To take that file folder, that big old thick or little bitty thin, whichever file folder, and he wants to replace it. He wants to take our spot on the scale. That's pretty awesome. I mean, that's, that's great news. He wants to take our sin and get rid of it and transform us, leading us into light, out of darkness into light and into full life, the life we were created to live. We weren't created to live in that darkness. Remember that darkness is a corruption of the good that God created. We weren't created to live in the darkness. And he wants to eradicate that from our lives. This woman caught in this inappropriate sexual relationship was brought to Jesus, and Jesus didn't say, well, it's okay, everyone sins. I I didn't read that. I, I can't find that. And Jesus didn't say, hey, you know what? You know, we're all sinners and we sin every day. I don't see that. What, what did he say? Go and sin no more. That's what he said, right? Go and sin no more. And I've read the Gospels many times over. It's the story of Jesus. And he does this often where he will meet someone who has a heart that is far from the heart of God, that has transgressed the heart of God, and there's behavior issues, yeah, and he will forgive them of their sins. And he says, go and sin no more, or he says, follow me. Those are the two things I find him saying. He doesn't say, hey, you know what, it's okay. He says, you have sin, now you go be transformed. Go and sin no more. And she leaves different. She leaves forgiven. i got to think she wrote the happy song we sang a while ago. You know, everybody's singing now. Why? I don't know. I'm just happy. My sin is gone. And Jesus has transformed me. She left forgiven, not condemned. Romans 8, verse 1 says, Now there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. That is powerful. Think about it. Jesus says, let the one who has never sinned cast the first stone. I don't know if they all got it then, but I do. He is the only one who had the right to cast the first stone. Jesus himself. He says, okay, let the one who's never sinned cast the first stone. And then instead of picking up that rock, he stoops down and doodles again in the dirt as if to say, and I'm not throwing it. Let the Holy One of God cast the first stone. Let the Creator cast the first stone. If anybody has the right, it's the one who made you. It's the one who created you, the one who knows you inside and out, the one whose very law and heart, by the way, that you're breaking. And Jesus says, and I'm not going to do it. I'm not. That's grace. That's amazing grace. And Jesus says that over each and every one of us. He says, I'm not going to throw throw that stone at you. And I'm going to offer you instead forgiveness if you will go and sin no more. Jesus frees from sin. Jesus frees from sin. What exactly does that mean? It means a couple of things. It means, one, He frees us, and we've seen this already, He frees us from condemnation of sin, or from the punishment of sin that accompanies sin. The Bible says, and it's not just a Christian thing, this is kind of a universal in almost every religion around the world, that the wages of sin is death. It's worded differently in different religions, but the wages of sin is death. And Jesus says, I'll take that condemnation. I'll transform transform you. I'll free you from that. Also, secondly, Jesus, in Jesus there is freedom from slavery to sin. What is that? What is slavery to sin? It means that, that thing inside of you that says, well, I just have to do this. I just, I just can't stop. That's slavery. That's bondage, by the way. I can't do anything but this. And he frees us. It says right there, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. It don't have to be this way. Well, I was born this way. We were all born into sin. Jesus said you must be reborn. You must be reborn. 
and you don't have to live in slavery to sin. And third, in Jesus, there's freedom from a heart of sin. From a heart of sin. That means Jesus transforms sinners by giving us a new heart, by giving us His heart, by not just taking our heart and lining it up with the heart of God, but He recreates in us a new heart, replaces that heart in us. It's called restoration. It's called salvation. It's called holiness. We take our sin, our selfishness, our hardened and heavy and coarse hearts, and He takes those, and He takes our destructive words, and He takes our our tendency to create drama, and He takes our, our tendency to create division, and He makes all things new. He makes all things new. All things Jesus makes new. (laughs) And all means all, and that's all all means. Every bit of it. Forgiveness flows from the life of Jesus, and following Jesus leads out of darkness and into light and into a full life. Lord, thank you for taking our hearts as we offer them to you. We entrust them to you. Lord, help us to live entrusted to you. Um, Take our hearts, Lord, and mold them, make them more like yours as we travel with you. And we thank you, Lord, that you you working through us to transform us, to do what we can't in our own strength. So thank you for the light and the life that you lead us into as you lead us out of darkness. Your light is that marvelous light. Thank you for awakening us. Thank you for taking the stones from our hands and from our hearts and replacing them with yours. And now we give them to you for the works you created for us to do long ago. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, thank you so much for joining us today. I pray you come back next week and we're going to look at how Jesus says to not worry. So don't worry. Come back next week. Grace and peace be with you. (laughs) 